Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am honored. I believe that there is much that can be done by cooperating between the United States and China, and I hope in this short amount of time I can explain why. I started programming 51 years ago this year. I was 20 at the time, and it was a time before we had all of the facilities available to us today. There were no compilers, no assemblers, no facilities for inputting into a computer other than switching each bit on the front panel of the computer. It was the very beginning of the information age. When I was 23, I got a job with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in America, and for the first time, I was exposed to computer security, even though I did not know it at the time, because there was no name for cybersecurity, no name for computer security. It happened because I was working on satellite weather analysis, and it was that during the Cold War, and the world first saw images of missile installations in Cuba taken from a satellite. So, in those days, we had no digital data transfer. Everything was analog. And computers were large. You could not put a computer into space. They weighed thousands of pounds. And every bit in memory was a donut-shaped iron core with three wires running through it. So you can imagine how large and how slow and inefficient they were. And yet I was assigned the task of somehow applying digital technology to analog transmissions. I do not know if I succeeded. Uh, at that time, we had a different relationship with China, so perhaps if there are members of the military here who were young men or women at that time, perhaps you would know if I was successful. Um, nevertheless, that was my first exposure to computer security, and I fell in love with it. And I've been in that field ever since. 48 years of computer security. I, I think I'm the oldest computer security professional that I know. So, the world of politics has changed dramatically. When I first worked for the National Institute and Space Administration, Russia and China were not our friends. But very slowly, over the years, the political situation has changed. And we are now on much friendlier terms with both nations, both China and with Russia. But political situations change very slowly. Technology changes very rapidly. I know because I have watched it for 50 years. And with that perspective, of watching this change, I see a lot that maybe you younger folks do not see. In 1987, I wrote the world's first virus scanning program. It was based on a concept of finding malware after it has arrived in your system. And it worked fine for doing that. And for many years, it was sufficient. But when I designed the first antivirus program, the McAfee Antivirus Scanner, we had no digital communications to speak of. There was no internet. Hacking was a very small field, and very few people engaged in it. Times have changed dramatically. Ten years ago, I gave an interview with the New York Times when I said that the antivirus business is going to decline because it is not as useful as it used to be. Today, our antivirus products prevent fewer than 25 percent of attempted hacks. 
That means that 75% of attempted hacks will succeed if that is the only protection that we have. 75% is a good number for a hacker. It sounds good to me. That means three out of four attempts will succeed and only one will fail. So the world has changed. Hacking has become far more sophisticated than it used to be. Hackers have toolkits that they can get from the dark web that cost very little money but have a great deal of power. And the technology that we have used to protect ourselves simply has not caught up. Much of it is due to inertia, that is the difficulty of changing course when we have such a massive industry that's going in one direction. But the antivirus industry and everything that it has spawned is based on a paradigm that has changed completely. The antivirus paradigm has to wait for malware to enter your system before something can happen. In most cases, it is now too late. If you look at the major hacks that have occurred around the world in the past two years, you will find that most of them are not even detected for more than a year. That's way too late. They are detected after the damage is done, after the bitcoins are stolen, after the data has been copied and released to some competitor, after the problem has already affected you as a person, your company, or your government, or the world at large. So a new paradigm is needed, a paradigm that is proactive rather than reactive. Hackers do not decide to hack a company or you and then instantly get inside your intranet, find the database and steal everything. It takes many months for this to happen, sometimes years. We have the technology today in my own company, MGT, we are working on multiple products that are proactive products. That means they find the hacker before the hacker gets into your system and can do any damage. This is very simple, really. It requires a little bit of heuristics and artificial intelligence, but a great shift in our understanding and acceptance of cybersecurity products. There are products that are available today that can tell you the first packet of information that is sent by a hacker and say that this is an anomaly. This packet should not be here. And can alert the IT department, either the technicians or the IT head or whoever they wish, and it can be looked into. But we don't have those procedures in place in companies today. And it takes time and money and effort to implement these procedures. So companies are slow to adopt the new technology. This is our fundamental problem. It is easy to develop these products. It is difficult for companies to implement them. It requires changes in the organization structure. It requires education. It requires a new way of thinking. And as we all know, when we change thinking or education, that change comes very slowly. But we no longer have the time to waste. We are teetering on an edge 
not just here in China, not just in the U.S. or in Russia or in any other country, but as a global society, as the human species, we are teetering on the edge of an abyss, a cliff. And we must understand that. Hackers have enormous power, enormous power. They can shut down electrical production stations, make cars drive off of the road. Last year, two hackers in America drove a Jeep off the road from 1,000 miles away. It was being driven by a reporter from Wired magazine, and it had been prearranged, fortunately. But what if a thousand hackers just wanted to have some fun and started running cars off the road? They can do it because we have put computers into our automobiles and our airplanes. Last year also, a very close friend of mine, one of the most famous hackers in America, a gentleman named Chris Roberts, took control of a Boeing airliner operated by United Airlines on a flight from Chicago to Philadelphia. He did this by hacking into the entertainment system, which was connected to the flight control system. Now, he did not do this maliciously. For months beforehand, he had talked to Boeing aircraft manufacturer and to United Airlines and told them about this problem. But they did not believe him. So he risked his freedom by demonstrating very briefly on a real flight how easy this is. Now in America, he was arrested, he was detained, only for two days. The FBI fortunately understood he meant no harm. But this is the problem. People do not understand the power in the hands of the hacking community. Fortunately, the overwhelming majority of hackers are white hat hackers. But what if that were to change? What if all of these people who are attempting to do good by demonstrating to us the weaknesses in our security and we keep treating them like criminals, what happened if they all turned bad? Or what would happen if the bad hackers that currently exist started banding together in large communities, almost like political systems, and decided to do damage to a country? Please see how simple it would be for 1,000 dedicated hackers to destroy completely the American society and culture, or even here in China, your own culture. Why it has not happened yet, I do not know. But I do know this. They have the capability. They do not yet have the organization. We must act. And we must act soon. And we must act together, not as independent nations. Not as the U.S. or China or Russia, but as the global human species. Our species has never before faced a threat of this magnitude. And we have not noticed it, by and large. It is we, in the cybersecurity arena, that are seeing it. Many of you see this. I know you do. I have talked to many of you. Intelligent people, well-educated and knowledgeable. But this information needs to spread from these rooms 
into the world at large. And it needs to be done soon. It has to start with us. Is it not our obligation as cybersecurity professionals to warn our fellow humans of a coming catastrophe? And you may think that I am exaggerating or I am an alarmist. I promise you, I am not. I am friends with many of the hackers who have the capability to do enormous damage if they so chose. Enormous damage. At DEF CON this year, there was a demonstration by a couple of young hackers who had hacked into a smart thermostat, the little instrument that controls the heating or the cooling, and had hypothesized that you could turn this hack into malware by making it ransomware. If someone hacked into your data center's thermostat and turned this, the temperature way up, you would lose all of your computers if something wasn't done. And this is just one of thousands of demonstrations and presentations at DEF CON by brilliant young kids who are trying to help by showing us the enormous power within their hands. So it starts with us. And who do we talk to? Well, we talk to our friends. We talk to our employers. And those of you who have access to members of your government, you must talk to them. This has gone way beyond a national problem. This is no longer America versus Russia or China or Iran or any other country. The Internet does not care about nations. It is a global net with global access. Three months ago, a 15-year-old boy hacked into the FBI, our Federal Bureau of Investigations, and stole the names, the addresses, the social security numbers, and the photographs of every single undercover agent in America. A 15-year-old boy. What do you think this boy can do in 10 years? Or even today? If he was joined by a thousand other 15-year-old boys with similar capabilities. So we must accept that the technology that we created ourselves is no longer under our control. I wish I could say that it were, but it is not. When I began as a programmer 50 years ago, it was under our control. It was a tool used by man and woman for their own purposes. Look at it now. It is half of your memory. Ten years ago, I could remember my wife's telephone number. I don't have a clue now because my telephone remembers it for me. I don't have to keep a schedule today because that is done for me. Our smartphones have taken over much of the, the dullness of our lives and made our lives much easier. But what would happen if you lost this today and could never get it back? And all of the data on here was forever irretrievable. Your life would change, and not for the better. And if we all lost these phones at the same time, our society would be on the verge of communication collapse. We wouldn't know who to call or when or what to say. And if the Internet, which is a very fragile, ancient system, were to suddenly disappear, think about it just for a moment. 
our entire society would be at risk, enormously so. Everything that we do is now dependent upon these computers that we have created. Everything from farming, we're in America, farmers no longer drive tractors, they run joysticks, which makes their tractors come and go and do what they want. Food manufacturing, it is all automated. All of the sterilization and the canning and the packaging is under automatic control. Transportation is all scheduled by computer. These are fragile systems. Please see this. Two weeks ago, I was in Los Angeles and had to stay there for two days because Southwest Airlines lost a computer system for just part of a day. The entire company was paralyzed for nearly a week. We have forgotten how dependent upon these computer systems we have become. Are we still their master? I'm unsure. I do not think so. We have created our own master now. Because who is the slave if the master can make us do things as it wishes. Our cell phones know where we are, who we are calling, what we are saying. They can read our contacts and our emails. They know everything about us. Why? Because they have been designed to do so. Google and Apple designs the software for these phones with one purpose in mind, to find out as much information about you as it possibly can. Because it is information that is the new commodity of exchange. It is information that has value. So we have mobile devices that are designed from the ground up to collect information. Now, the designers were not doing something evil or wicked when they did this. No, they just weren't thinking. Because if someone wants to use that information to sell me something, I may choose not to buy it. It's my choice. But if someone wanting to sell me something can find this information, then so can a hacker. And what the hacker wants to do with me, I do not have any choice over. From the ground up, these systems have been designed without thinking about the implications of the future. Well, the future is now, and we are living in a world where we are constantly spied upon by the same devices that we created to make life easier for us. And if those people who are doing the spying are good people, then I have no problem. Unfortunately, we can't control our technology to just allow good people to access it. This is what we did not think through. There are bad people everywhere. If you have a couple of thousand people in your corporation, I promise you, I promise you, one of them has been planted by one of your competitors, or a foreign government, or some other agency, you know this is true. How difficult is it for a hacker to get a job? Well, it's pretty easy. They're good programmers. They're smart people. Clean up a little, put a suit on, apply for a job, smile, pretend to fit in. And then two years later, what might happen? Suddenly, your product has a back door accessible to hackers. And you think this may not be a problem? Let me tell you what happened to Ashley Madison last year, a $2 billion a year company that now no longer exists because an employee in the Information Technology Department 
was having an affair with the CTO. And the CTO at one point said, no more. And the employee brought down the entire company. Why? Because on the inside, a hacker has enormous power, or an angry employee has enormous power. They know where the data is. They know how it's used. They frequently know the passwords. And yet we have no protection against it because we have not thought things through. In my own company, MGT, in America, we have been working on new solutions, and many other companies have too, not just mine, that actually relate to the problems of this new world that we have created voluntarily without thinking through the implications. We cannot go back, we cannot throw our smartphones away or the other facilities that we have developed, but we must accept the reality that these phones and mobile devices and the hacking world have placed us in. We must accept that reality and we must live with it and work with it and build our security procedures to meet that reality. It will be difficult. It will be expensive. And it will be painful because we will have to change our thinking and we will have to learn something new. But if we're not willing to do that, then I fear for our species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael Let's welcome Mr. Zhou Hongyi, Honorary Chair of RSC Chairman and CEO of Qihu360 to give us a speech. Welcome. Uh,